Madhu, good evening. Can you hear me? Good evening. I can hear you. I'm just going to make you the co-host. Thank you. Bharat sir, Hi, good evening. Hello, Vengadesh. How are you? Good, sir. Good. <laughs> Thank up? you for joining us. That is not bad. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank God. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Can you see me? Can you hear me? All of that is good. Yes, I can see you. I can hear you. And uh, I can uh, just make you this one moment. Let me just see the active speaker. How good is the clarity? Yes, the clarity is good, sir. I can see you clearly. And I can yeah. even see your poster behind you. And also clarity is good. Okay. Audio is good. Can I uh, just Madhu? do one, one sample screen share also? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Sample I have made him share. the co-host. So he can do it. Allow me to... Uh... Uh, sir, you are the co-host, so you can share the screen. Oh, uh, okay, okay, okay. That's fair enough. Okay, so one second. Yeah. Can you all see the first slide? Yes, sir. Okay, Venkatesh, you can see the first slide? Yes, yes sir. sir. In search of the unknown white slide. And on the yeah. left, I can see the uh, pictures. Yeah, and this is also good. I'll, I'll, I'll make it into, basically, I'll play the slideshow. Yes. So. So you can freeze the slide. Yeah, fair enough. I, I'll just keep it. Okay, so we're good with everything. I will just get back into my... Are you uh, attendance today? Uh, sir, I'm sure we normally have a fairly large loyal audience. So, okay. and this is the first uh, program of the year. So ah, we okay. are breaking ice for 2021 with you. The last, uh, you know, the the. the Vast indulgence of the Jashan lasted through the year end. The euphoria lasted well till, till about, uh, you know, it, it's still on. But, uh, you know, now we thought, let's get on with the new year. <laughs> I know. I mean, the, the initiatives that you all have been doing have been like, uh, you know, like literally uh, overwhelming, full on. I mean, like a continuous thing of has, the events happening, no? Very active. Yes, sir. Yes, uh, uh, that's it. it. Even your WhatsApp group is extremely active. <laughs> yes, sir. So it's, I, it's been a great learning experience for many of us. And uh, yeah. see, we came into this uh, online space when everyone else did. Uh, and we started with rocket caves. And then we started with uh, uh, things like, uh, you know, archaeology, zoology. We call it a logy of Mumbai. And uh, then uh, 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 Herb Sprema in this that was my series, and uh, I had the privilege of six uh, sessions. Then there have been fabulous series. I think Mustan Sir Dalvi Sir's uh, package of uh, full week sessions was absolutely yeah. fabulous. You know, yeah, yeah. it was uh, you know uh, I mean he it was really nice. I mean it was amazing. Then you know stuff like transporting. You know transporting in Mumbai. You know we had people from. Specializing in different sides, you know. Such an incredible, diverse range of yes, you know, yes. subjects of that city. My God, it yes. And yeah. banking and finance was also very, very intensive. I mean, uh, some very uh, esteemed senior speakers had kindly consented to you know my and our requests. Yeah. I mean, yeah. we had Dr. Basil Sheikh and Shankar Jadhav and all you know very, very, very expert people who were there. Yeah. And we had uh, cartography, we've had, uh, you know, we've, I mean, we've had fantastic, uh, you know, range here. So we are kind of, uh, 
I mean, this is a place of belonging for many of us, and especially me. And uh, uh, I think, I think, I think uh, the MRC folks have been extremely, extremely nice to all of us. So, yeah. I mean, <laughs> I'm very grateful to be here. <laughs> yeah, it is. It is quite a. It's quite a privilege, quite an honor. I mean, you know, to be uh, uh, part of the Asiatic Society. Anyways, uh, you know, it's such a prestigious institution and has such an incredible pedigree and history. Uh, you know, and I'm really looking forward to coming and seeing the renovated premises. I, you know, I've been ga I've gathered that you know there's been a lot of work happening and that sort of kind of yes, 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 reopen soon. So uh, yes, yes, yes. Please come, sir. I'll be happy to show you around the statues and. Uh, Battle Fairs and William S. Yeah. and also please do come. Hello, Mr. Venkatesh. I am Udayan. Good evening, sir. Good evening, sir. Good evening. Very nice to be here. Nice to meet you, sir. Okay. Uh, oh, is that Mr. Bharatram speaking? Yes, that's right. Yeah. Oh, okay. uh, good evening, sir. Uh, that's me. <laughs> no, sure. Nice to meet you. Shainaz, ma'am, good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Bharat sir is with us. Good evening. And good evening, Shana. Yeah, hi, hi. <laughs> hi. Honored to have you with us. Honored to that. have you with us. It's very, very kind of <laughs> y'all to invite me. I mean, I'm really, really, really privileged and quite overwhelmed with the honor, to be honest. I mean, <laughs> no, we are very thankful to you for accepting our invitation, you know. Anytime, anytime. <laughs> and we hope we can do more programs with you. I look forward to that. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. look forward to that. It would be so very... please do give your suggestions, whatever more you would like to do, or we could do something different on photography. Yeah. Uh, field yeah. is yours for you to suggest. That's very kind. Okay. Okay. Yeah. In fact, you know, I've been in conversations with Venkatesh anyway, and, uh, you know, maybe ah. him and me, we can hatch a few plots because I think uh, if we put our heads together, uh, we can come up with some interesting suggestions because he's he's, yes, the, he's the knowledge bank. I'm the visual. <laughs> visual. <laughs> That's very kind of you. No, no. I, let we can definitely come up with something interesting, yeah. something different. You know. So let's try something. Yeah, yeah. Something out of the box we can. Explore. Yes, yes, yeah, yes, yeah. yes. <clears throat> Now, because our know, group is really very enthusiastic. We have yeah. a very, very enthusiastic group. I think you are also a member. Yes. And I so have you noticed, see the yeah. daily discussions that are happening, you know. Absolutely. Absolutely. Oh. Uh, I was just telling Venkatesh, in fact, uh, it's, it's such an active group and everybody is, uh, you know, uh, uh, almost without exception, everybody is participating in the conversations, which is very yes. you know, wonderful to see. Difficult to keep keep up with y'all, but <laughs> I try. <laughs> uh, we are also part of different groups, you know, people who are kind of like trying to, you know, uh, discuss issues relating to the Institute of Management, the dorms, that whole demolition thing, then the Central Vista project, everything that affects architects and architecture. You know, there's so many. Uh, different points of view and different uh, discussions taking place online now that, uh, yeah, it's uh, interesting times, uh, interesting times. And it's, a, you know, I think it's wonderful that everybody's able to share all these thoughts. Yeah. And I think, you know, it's just about six months since we started our activities, you know, yeah, yeah. we started end of Ma May, you yeah, know, and yeah. uh, I think the group has really gelled well and things are working out. Yeah, and fantastic initiatives. I mean, fantastic programs. I mean, excellent events. Uh, very out of the box, very interesting. I mean, pretty much, you know, I think uh, 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 getting really into the groove in, as far as Bombay is concerned, there's so many different things. About yeah, our, our, uh, unfortunately or fortunately, you know, we can deal only with Mumbai because ours is the Bombay, Mumbai Research Center. <laughs> so, you know, we have to keep on. Uh, Looking at uh, Mumbai in different different ways, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Well, I'll be honest with you. For me, uh, you know, this talk is going to be about much more than Bombay. It's not just. No, that's Bombay. fine. That's but, fine. That's but, fine. But uh, I, I'm going. I'm, I plan to end with Mumbai. So let me. <laughs> let's do it. <laughs> no, that's fine. That's absolutely I fine. I hope it's interesting for everybody. Yeah. Uh, sir, may I may I ask a question? Sure. Uh, will you allow? Uh, I mean, would it be okay if we recorded your lecture? Of course, yeah, yeah, please, please do because a lot of people are asking me already for recording. So, you know, people. On so Thursday, then, can we put it on our YouTube channel of yes, um, Asiatic? Absolutely. absolutely. Great, that great. Would be thanks, wonderful. thanks. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. That's what great. How was your day at work, Venkatesh, today? Usual day, sir. Nowadays, we are still at work from home, thankfully. So you know, most of the days, I I have to just put one laptop aside and switch on the other laptop. So, okay. <laughs> and then I go back and then I go back to work at 8.45. So I switch on the other laptop back. So wow. <laughs> you work late nights. Yeah, it's a season. It's audit season, so. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's true. No Hello, taxes. Everybody's filing taxes. Right? And I am. I'm going to have the service time today. I was just wanted to know can you give me general idea what can they do? So I had mistaken the time. I thought it was eight. Eight to uh, you know, our time eight. Okay. So uh, so I have been signed on for half an hour. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we start at seven. I'm yeah. guessing that we right. start very much on time. And then when I saw the uh, I saw the attachment to the email, it said. Eight o'clock. I mean, uh, starting at seven, so that made it eight thirty for me. Eight thirty in the morning. Okay. Okay. <laughs> which 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 part of the world are you in right now? I am in Massachusetts, USA. Okay. Okay. So yeah, yeah, yeah. New York time. Yeah. Boston. Yeah. Wow. You teach there, sir? Uh, no, no. I'm retired. Okay. I'm an old man. <laughs> it doesn't matter. <laughs> But, All the uh, better to teach, you know. Yeah. I always say that it's a strange. We have, you know, there's a strange paradox we all live through, where we we accumulate knowledge over the years, and then you know we grow old and people retire, and just when they when they can really contribute and give back and and, and <laughs> share their knowledge and experience with so many other people, a lot of people just say that you know, oh no, I'm retired now. Hello, hello. <laughs> I always say, you know, come on, don't retire because this is the time when you can really give back. I I do try to help as much as I can I'm for sure. different I'm areas, sure. but I don't. I haven't taken a regular uh, teaching job as such. Sure, sure. Fair enough. Um, but I, I do a little little bit of consulting. Okay. Uh, okay. Few days a month. Yeah. yeah. And you've lived uh, many years in the U.S. Uh, yeah, I think forty-two years now. Wow, that's a long time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so when I got this, my cousin, uh, I guess she's the chairperson, uh, Meenal Shirsagar. Minal is uh, one of the vice presidents. Yeah. Oh, okay. Oh, wonderful. And so she sent me the uh, link because I've always been interested. And Dr. Mani Kamerkar was my aunt. Okay. I, I am Uday and Kamerkar, by the way. Okay. Okay. Nice to meet you. <laughs> so. Uh, yeah. Strange times we are all going through in this in this. Uh, in this period, this era, I, it's even stranger here. I than know. Anywhere else. <laughs> I know. You know, it's almost surreal what's happening around the world today. Yes. Yeah. But there's something or the other going on 
every place in the exactly everywhere everywhere there's no place yeah. which is uh, you know it, we we don't necessarily get the news from parts of the world certain parts of the world we're not you know in that loop whereas uh, you know western countries we're always uh, kind of influenced by you know the, the media and you know because they're so much stronger but yeah everywhere every part of the world i mean including right. japan and uh, any any place you take everybody is going through some very uh, kind of uh, <laughs> weird bizarre kind of times you know yes the so last year we were <clears throat> supposed to go to the um, Angkor Wat and that area, Cambodia and, uh, and Vietnam. But uh, that was, the trip was supposed to start 6th of March. And that's when everything blew up and yeah, we had to cancel. Yeah. And yeah. Since then, we haven't left, we haven't even left the state. Yeah, <laughs> it's tough, it's tough. I mean, I, I travel normally 15 days a month. So for me, this has been a complete nightmare because, uh, you know, I'm, I'm always on the move. You know, Goa is my base. I live and work out of Goa. But uh, photography-wise, I'm traveling 15 to 20 days every month. I'm in continuously on it. Ah. Um, suddenly to be, uh, you know, it's like having the rug pulled out from under your feet. And it's like suddenly I'm sitting on my <laughs> chair and I'm wondering what to do. <laughs> it's been a difficult time. It's been a difficult time. But it's an opportunity to learn. I think uh, and that's what at least I've focused on is acquiring knowledge and, and learning everything that I ever wanted to learn. <laughs> I'm trying to kind of yeah mm. uh, keep myself occupied by acquiring new skills and kind of you know widening my knowledge and it's a good thing. It's a strange thing. I guess one makes the best of you know difficult time. So when I saw the subject of your talk, I said, I have to listen because I'm very interested in photography, which is why I travel a couple of times a year, somewhere or the other. Okay. Like a uh, year before last, we had been to Russia okay, and saw well. a lot of things. We've been to China. Um, well, so, I, I wish, I wish, I hope your, uh, I wish you all the best. I hope your Angkor Wat trip turns out because that is an absolutely spectacular place absolutely that's what i've heard and you that's really what enjoy it. that we are going to go yeah um but it wasn't to be at least yeah. in 2019 yeah. i mean 2020 yeah. yeah so uh now i still haven't up for getting uh getting my vaccination so once yeah. both of us are vaccinated yeah. then we will look at look at some trips uh, may hopefully uncle what yeah. because uh, we're, yeah. We are both interested in looking, seeing those temples and the architecture and Fabulous. everything there. Angkor Wat, I have been to, but Borobudur is still on my bucket list. Where is this? Borobudur is in Indonesia. Oh, okay. And it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a also an incredibly spectacular temple complex, and it's been kind of restored beautifully over the mm. over the years. And uh, it's a, it's a single temple complex, unlike uh, Angkor Wat, which is spread around the spread out area. Yeah. But uh, exquisite. I mean, Borobudur is also exquisite. It's it's more exquisite. Buddhist than Hindu, but uh, yes. I think Venkatesh, you've been to Borobudur, no? <laughs> yes, yes, I've been twice. <laughs> Yes. You're kidding me, twice. No, I've been there once. Yeah. <laughs> the place just pulls you back. So I know, you know, I I've been there twice. That. So okay. I had the fortune of working there for a year. So in, wow. in, in financial wow. financial organization though. So I wow. it was an overnighter for me. And was, what is the uh, what is the closest big city to Borobudu? Uh Jog Jakarta. Uh, Jog Jakarta itself. Okay. Jog Jakarta is about 45 minutes flight from Jakarta. Okay. Okay. Oh, Jakarta. I see. Okay. It's like a suburban kind of okay, interesting. 45 minutes flight. So that's that's not close by then. That's probably 150 miles away somewhere. Yeah, yeah about 400, uh, uh, yeah, about four, three, 400 odd kilometers. It's an overnight oh, train. So. Okay, yeah. yeah. Indonesia, people forget, is it's kind of a long chain of islands. No, it, it, yes. it, it occupies a very large uh, swath of ocean. Uh, <laughs> It's a very picturesque journey. It's yeah. a very beautiful journey, you know. It's I can a... imagine. Yeah. I mean, I did the train journey from Bangkok to 
uh, Ayutthaya, uh, which was very oh. beautiful as well. Ayutthaya is a spectacular. Ayutthaya is spectacular too. Yeah. The Thai Ayutthaya. Ayutthaya, see Sachinalai and Sukhothai. So these are the three places to see it all together. Yeah, and next time I come to you <laughs> to guide me. <laughs> I think uh, it's good to be able to share that kind of knowledge and mm -hmm. you know, and wonderful. So where are you, Mr. Venkatesh? Sir, I'm in Mumbai. Oh, you're in Mumbai. Okay. Is that the Asiatic building behind you? Yes, sir. Oh, okay. <laughs> Sense of belonging. <laughs> He's using the latest technology for his backdrop. Yeah, I need a green screen before I can put any of my photos up there. So, um, because otherwise it, it doesn't, uh, it, nothing works properly unless yeah, I have a green yeah. screen. So, yeah. uh, is that what you have, Mr. Venkatesh? The, uh, so, sir, yes, sir. Yes, yeah. sir. Green screen is part of a tablet. So, oh, okay. Page. Uh, my computer okay. is old, so it doesn't have that technology. Yeah, so it wasn't around when I bought my computer. So. <laughs> okay, Shanaz ma'am, can we start? Seven o'clock? Yeah, I think so. Let's start. I'm sure people yeah. will join in. Sure, sure. Madhu ma'am, please uh, take the mic. Madhu? Yeah, yeah I'm there. Yeah. Good evening, everyone. MRC has opened its account in 2021 with this rather interesting lecture by Bharat Rama, Mr. Bharat Rama Ramamrutham, uh, who is a leading architecture, landscape, and travel uh, photographer. A word about uh, the MRC itself. The MRC, that is the Mumbai Research Center, was established at the behest of the late Sri Arun Tikekar and it promotes multidisciplinary research on Mumbai and Bombay presidency. It was formed in 2009, and today we can say that it is a 21-year-old young adult, which is being ably led by our ever-enthusiastic and dynamic chairperson, Dr. Shehrnaz Nalwala. Thanks to her leadership, we have been able to deliver more than a dozen online academic lecture series since the lockdown started in March. And what's more, thanks to her again, and of course, a very, very uh, creative uh, team, which was led by uh, Shehrnaz, as well as Ramesh Gauri Raghavan and Mr. Venkatesh, we were able to organize an online Mumbai festival, Jashne Dastane Mumbai, in December last year. Uh, during this adios, festival, adios, 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 we had the privilege of inviting uh, the who's who from the world of academics, arts, music, and whatnot, from across the city, the state, the nation, and the globe. And I now invite um, Mr. Venkatesh to introduce our guest speaker for the day. Thank you, Madhu. Uh, my privilege to welcome uh, Bharat sir uh, to uh, encapsulate his uh, achievements over three decades. It's difficult to do it in two minutes, uh, but to give a larger context, uh, uh, we have, uh, you know, great architects working on, 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 the, on the heritage monuments and we have great photographers. So he combines uh, the best of both. He's an architect and a photographer. And uh, most of you would be acquainted with the books Bombay Gothic, uh, Elephanta, Bombay Gothic by Christopher London, Elephanta by George Michel, and uh, Temples of South India, uh, and uh, uh, Nizam's Jewels, and uh, there are books, uh, several books on South India, including Chidambaram and all that. So there are these several books on uh, uh, built heritage that he has photographed, and some of them he's published through his uh, institution, Graph Media. So uh, uh, it's a privilege to have him here because uh, we, as a, a heritage group, have used and have benefited from a lot of his work over the last so many months and years. And uh, uh, through these books, he's, he's, he's already been part of our uh, uh, journey into uh, uh, understanding these built spaces and architecture through visual communication. So uh, uh, with that uh, small introduction, I request him to take the floor. And uh, uh, it's a privilege to start the year 2021 uh, with this uh, event. 
So, uh, uh, Bharat sir, thank you for joining us today and uh, please take the mic and I will put the rest of the people on mute, including myself. Thank you very much, Venkatesh. That's very kind of you. And thank you all for, for having me, for inviting me. Uh, it's quite a privilege and it's a, it's a difficult act to follow because I've been following some of the talks uh, organized by the Asiatic in the last few months. And uh, predominantly, they have been very intellectual, very academic filled with knowledge and information. And suddenly I have been called in uh, to, to launch the 2021 series, so to speak. But my talk is not going to be academic, unfortunately, uh, at least in the strict sense of the word. Uh, it's going to be a very visual one. It's going to be uh, predominantly based on my experiences and uh, you know the places I've been to and the places I've seen, the books that I have done. So let me, uh, without any uh, further uh, ado, uh, start at the very beginning. Um, a lot of people say, where, uh, where do you come from or where are you from? Uh, that's a very typical question that we face in India most of the time. And uh, to a large part of it, I always get a little flummoxed because I, you know, when people say, where are you from? I'm, I'm, you know, I've lived in so many different places and I've traveled so much that it's very difficult. So I say, where do you want me to start? You know. Uh, if you, if you say, okay, I was born in Chennai, but it comes down to this, that the predominant and the most influential years of my life were really in Bombay. I grew up in Mumbai. Uh, I still call it Bombay because I left Bombay a few years ago and I, I'm still not able to get my head around the Mumbai thing. But anyway, it'll come to me occasionally, I guess. But um, I grew up in Bombay and growing up in Bombay, uh, in the 70s, in the late 60s and 70s was a very, very special thing because Bombay was not the Bombay that you see today. The, that Bombay was like, uh, you know, there was no traffic. You could travel by bus everywhere. We used to cycle everywhere uh, and there was no risk. There was no danger. There was no, you could, you could go by bicycle 10 minutes from Malabar Hill to, you know, Kaf Parade. Uh, and it was that really, it was that easy. And, uh, one of the things that I used to do with friends of mine is uh, we used to take uh, buses late at night. We used to take the double-decker bus and sit up on the top deck and uh, lean forward, keep the window open, lean forward, and literally go through the city at night. It was spectacular because it was, it was just with that breeze in your, in your face and you're looking at all the you know buildings at night. It, it used to be quite an experience. And we used to do this a lot. And now, so this was an incredibly, uh, how do I say, a fascinating, and it's something that which will always stay with me in terms of, you know, uh, uh, my memories. And uh, of course, along with that, uh, I must not forget that my, my father uh, was a very, very, very strong influence on me uh, in terms of, uh, you know, travel, photography, uh, you know, design. Uh, he was the one who kind of inculcated the love for some of these things in me, and, you know, Knowingly or unknowingly, he kind of unleashed uh, all these uh, passions inside me, and uh, you know it's been a fantastic journey. So I I I studied in Bombay. I was in school in Bombay, and then I went to study architecture in Ahmedabad. Uh, I studied at SEPT, at the School of Architecture. Um, now, in SEPT itself, um, you know the the uh, the school was an open school in the sense that it was you know, set up by Balkrishna Doshi, uh, the only Pritzker uh, Prize winner from India. And he was, he, in my opinion, was and is, continues to be one of the greatest of humanitarian architects. And, and the richest interactions in Ahmedabad took place not so much in the classroom, but outdoors, on the lawns of the campus, in the seats around the cafeteria or the canteen, and in different locations. And you know, the interchange of knowledge, the exchange of idea, the thoughts and, you know, stuff like that. We always, we, you know, one of the things that Doshi always talked about was he talked of India and he talked of India with a great, in, with an immense passion. Uh, he talked of India, of Indian art, he talked about Indian crafts, he talked about culture and of course he talked about architecture, but it was always about the people. Uh, you know, architecture was not devoid of people and crafts and the arts and culture. And, and because it was an open campus uh, with no lockable doors, gates, symbolically allowing us this freedom to reach out to the world, uh, the world become 
became part of our education. I'd, I'd like to just, one second, I'd like to just share my screen a little bit now because I think uh, I'd like to share a few thoughts with you all while we are going through this. Uh, one second, sorry. Give me a second, I just want to switch off the video. So you all, are you all able to see the screen? I hope everybody is able to see the screen. Anyway. Yes, so, yes, we yeah, are. Yeah. So um, this was a, like, an, like I said, this was an open campus. And, and, and one of the things that, you know, the, the beauty of an open campus like that, where there were no doors or windows and there was no locks and there was no, you know, guards and chaukidars and gates and walls. Uh, it was really very symbolic of, of the, the principles and the values that were kind of inculcated in us. And one of that was the open and free dissemination of knowledge. It was such a critical part of our education, you know, that, that if you know something, share it. And, and this is what everybody did in Ahmedabad and Doshi most of all, uh, because he had so much to share with all of us. So this had a very profound effect on me. Firstly, it embedded deeply within me the idea of sharing. And secondly, it awoke uh, inside me an insatiable hunger and a curiosity to learn, to discover, and to share. And this completely changed my way of thinking with respect to architecture and education. After completing my Sint in Amdavar, I became a bit of a wanderer. Um, by then, I was beginning to feel By then I was beginning to feel uh, the stirrings of, of you know, my true calling, which was photography. Uh, uh, I bought a motorcycle and spent time traveling around India. I, I loved books and I spent a lot of time browsing in many bookshops we had in those days. Um, these, these are some images of, of the School of Architecture and the kind of environment we grew up in. I mean, that was, you know, pretty much a classroom and, and there's, uh, you know, Mr. Doshi himself, uh, you know, holding uh, uh, a discussion, an open discussion with people. Um, so, yeah, so uh, I love books and, and, and I spent a lot of time in bookshops. And in those days, uh, there were not that many bookshops and even the books on India were few and far between. Large format books particularly were very rare. <coughs> But all the large format, beautiful, lush coffee table books, so to speak, uh, were done by foreign photographers. And I'm thinking to myself, why, why are there no Indian photographers doing large format books? Because at that point of time, there was only Raghu Rai and possibly Raghu Bir Singh doing you know, that kind of work. And then there was architecture. I had um, you know, benefited from being at SEPT in Ahmedabad. And here was a field that was hugely misunderstood and equally misunderstood today in so many respects. And it was a field that I had grown passionately fond of and one that inspired me to open my eyes to this country's rich design and craft traditions. Now, back in Bombay, uh, after Ahmedabad, uh, a two year stint, well, a little bit over a year and a half actually, with Charles Correa, taught me an entirely new way of looking at architecture and design and made me realize two things. I was a fairly good photographer of architecture, and at best, I would have been an average architect, simply because I felt that I didn't have it in me, so to speak. But Doshi and Korea inspired me in completely and entirely different ways. I had grown to love architecture, and I was beginning to understand why they called it the mother of all the arts. Due to its omnipresent nature and its powerful influence on human well-being, I sincerely felt that it had the potential to exert a profound influence in completely transforming our lives, which potentially could you know, help towards solving problems that we were facing in the world. But having said that, I became, because photography I turned out to be my calling, I became deeply committed to photography. And this desire to photograph and share the beauty that I was seeing around me. So I decided that the best way to do this was to create beautiful books on India and have a strong focus on architecture and design. 
At that time, the majority of the books, again, like I said, were done by international photographers who came to India in search of this diversity and richness, which they did not necessarily have in their country. And of course, you must remember at that time, there was no internet, so there was no sharing uh, over, the, uh, over the net. So now we came to a point where I started reaching out to publishers and started wanting to do books. And for me, it was always about, you know, creating uh, the opportunities for myself. And I would put together book projects and I would come up with ideas about different places. And I had all these proposals in hand and I would go around to publishers and kind of reach out to them and offer, uh, you know, these projects and say, look, would you be interested in doing something like that with me? So, Fortunately for me, over the years, I was really blessed because, like you can see here, these are 10 of the books that I have done, and then you will find another 10. So effectively, these are just the 20, and there were a few more actually, uh, which I've not featured here, but this is a broad cross-section of the books that I was involved in. Um, so let's start at the top left, Living Wood. Living Wood was, oh, okay, Living Wood. So this was my first book in 1992. And I was contacted by Dr. George Michel, who over the years has become a really dear friend and a collaborator on many books uh, subsequently. Uh, the assignment was to travel by road across Southern India, photographing wood craftsmanship and the use of wood in architecture. And this covered temples, churches, mosques, mansions, as well as chariots and bahanas. The book also served as a catalogue for exhibitions in the Whitechapel Gallery in London, and then in Bradford and Hamburg, also in 1992. <coughs> Excuse me. Even though I had traveled quite a bit earlier when I accept, it was during this project that I encountered beauty like I had never imagined. In complete awe, I developed almost a reverence for crafts and craftsmanship and design into all its manifestations. These are just some of the images that I dug out from my, from my archives and tried to scan them up a little bit. You'll have to forgive the quality of the scan. They're not that good, but it was something that we did in a bit of a hurry. So, uh, you know, hopefully they'll get better as we, we go through that process. But these are, these are basically photographs of chariots that, uh, you know, uh, I photographed as part of the Living Wood uh, project. But that was it, the bug got me. Uh, my appetite had been whetted and I wanted more and I became insatiable. So these, so these, wait, all these are chariots and uh, the second book that I did was called The Temple Towns of Tamil Nadu. And I'm not sure what these lines are on the screen. Okay, okay. Um, Temple Towns of Tamil Nadu. Again, this was a book that was initiated by me. Um, and it allowed me to travel to the great temple cities of Tamil Nadu and, and um, one second, why, what is this? I'm sorry, I'm not, I'm not sure what these streaks are which have suddenly appeared. Just give me a second. It's very strange. Uh, please bear with me everybody just for a second. I'm going to just quit this and start it up again. I know, I think they're on the project. Not your fault, Bharat. Someone is drawing lines. No. Is that right? No, no, they're on the lens of the projector. What, but I don't have a projector here. No, not lens on the projector. Somebody is doing annotation. Uh, Just uh, stop sharing and share again. That's it. Okay, okay, because it's a very strange yeah. kind of thing. Yeah. No, no, just stop sharing and share again and uh, don't okay. allow anybody to annotate. And it it's, 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 all gone. Gone. it's better now. It's gone. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Very My nice. Good. Yeah, that was really strange. <laughs> okay, <laughs> uh, sorry about that. Um, so let's uh, coming back to uh, the Temple Towns of Tamil Nadu. Um, so this was a spectacular book. This this really uh, allowed me to uh, travel through the great temple cities of Tamil Nadu. Uh, you know, starting from Kanjivaram. Uh, right through to Chidambaram, Sri Rangam, Tiruvannamalai, uh, in, in Chennai, in, in Mailapur itself. And, and 
you know, one of the things that I was constantly um, thinking about was what made these sacred centers so powerful and, and how come they have lasted, how come that power, that energy that they put out has lasted so many centuries? What attracted people to them? And who were these people? So the search continued and all these were part of the temple book. In the, the, what was beautiful is in those days, there was no restrictions. Once we had some basic permissions to go and photograph these places, one could actually climb into and up the Gopurams and get these spectacular aerial views of the city around. Uh, you know, this is Sri Rangam with the river, the Kaveri River in the distance, with all the concentric walls and the Gopurams. This was the main, uh, you know, the, the golden uh, sanctum sanctorum of, of Sri Rangam Temple. Again, aerial views showing the scale and the walls and, and, and the, the, the concentric nature of the layouts. This was Mylapore itself in, in Chennai. Uh, this was also Mylapore, uh, the tank with water in those days. But all these places have changed dramatically because you know there's hoardings and there's advertising and billboards have come up everywhere. So it's, it's, it's really difficult nowadays to kind of uh, you know, uh, recreate these kind of places. Then followed a book on Ajanta and Elora for Maharashtra tourism, and, an, and another book with Mark uh, called The Architecture in Victorian and Edward in India. And then, of course, came From Bombay to Mumbai, a book I think some of you all are familiar with, uh, which is an opportunity to really work with uh, some amazing people in that city and to actually learn about, uh, you know, um, how, the, how the city developed and grew. Um, now, in 1998, I had an opportunity to create a visual catalog of, uh, you know, inspiration based on the principles and major styles of this interior design in India, uh, which had already developed and were blending the influence of so many different cultures. So the book was titled Inside India, Quintessential Indian Style. And it encapsulated these designs and colors and textures and the decorative details of India as adopted by architects and interior designers at that time. Uh, it attempted to highlight the diverse styles with a focus on doors, windows, you know, floors, walls, fabrics, and other applications in, with respect to spaces and also furniture. Um, I think this was a time when our heritage in design and our heritage in the crafts were getting known across the world. And India was just beginning to become the flavor of the decade. I mean, of course, that's continued now for the last three decades. Uh, India is still very much uh, a go-to place for any kind of inspiration uh, with respect to design and crafts. And, and uh, so this was, this was a great opportunity to actually kickstart that entire process. And it was a wonderful eye-opener for me because I got to actually choose and curate what I was going to photograph. And, and I got tacted people and then I you know, traveled around India and photographed stuff. So it was really exceptionally uh, a, 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 an incredible learning experience. Then came uh, the Dance of the Peacock. Now this was a collaborative project. This was my, my sister, Dr. Usha Balakrishnan. Some of you might even know her. Uh, I'm sure a lot of you have heard of her. Uh, she's one of the foremost jewelry experts in India today. And she wanted to do this book uh, called The Dance of the Peacock, Jewelry Traditions of India. It was an incredible exercise because we actually traveled, again, we traveled around the country uh, photographing just exquisite pieces of jewelry. Um, and for me, this was a lifelong lesson in how to handle priceless jewels and an in-depth understanding of how to use, now this was where photography really kicked in because you know this was, I had to learn uh, in, in great detail how to light and how to use control lighting uh, to photograph precious and fragile objects, especially jewelry. And, and these learnings were many. Uh, the meticulous attention to detail uh, made me realize, and, and you know, the craftsmen who made these pieces were, uh, you know, the, the, the kind of passion and the kind of commitment and dedication that they had put into creating these made me realize that when I was photographing them, if I did not portray or approach my work with the same kind of dedication and that same kind of passion, 
and the same kind of complete commitment, uh, you know, I would I would be failing in my job. I, you know, to do it justice, I would have to actually adopt the same kind of attitude that they had, and that was an incredible learning uh, uh, in in itself. Uh, Subsequent to that, we did another book. Uh, sorry, this is from the second book, actually. This is from the Jewels of the Nizams, uh, because Dr. Usha was again approached by the Department of Culture this time uh, from the government of India, who had acquired the uh, Nizam's jewels. Um, they were, they'd, been, they'd been acquired for a small fortune by the government, and uh, they'd been sitting in the vaults of the Reserve Bank of India, I think HSBC first, and then the Reserve Bank of India uh, for many years. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, Usha was then approached uh, to document and get the jewels photographed and they wanted to do a book uh, which would launch at the same time as a grand exhibition that the government was planning at the National Museum in Delhi. Now these were the Nizam's jewels, remember. The Indian government had paid, like I said, a force for fortune to acquire them and they'd been sitting for many years. But now we were taken deep down into the basements of the RPI in Bombay. And I was given a small room, about six and a half square meters, which is about eight feet by eight feet, maybe. And in that space, I had to set up a studio with lights, a backdrop, and, and with all the paraphernalia and accessories that I required to photograph these gemstones and jewelry. And, and possibly jewelry is possibly one of the most difficult things to photograph. Um, so this was a, like a really steep learning curve for me. And, and these pieces, the, you know, what was incredible was, uh, all these jewels were brought into that little room in the basement in large aluminium trunks. And these trunks, when they were opened, were filled with bundles of tissue. And within each bundle of tissue was wrapped these, these little, you know, again, these little crushed bundles, inside which were some of the most beautiful jewels that I had ever seen. A lot of the jewels were not in good condition, so some of them had to be almost reassembled on the tabletop before photographing them. And while uh, Dr. Usha was actually doing the documentation and the measurements and you know, uh, uh, doing the valuation part of it, I was doing the photography. Uh, it was an incredible experience. And of course the book turned out really good and it become a bit of a collector's item because it's not available anymore. It's all sold out. And you know, because it was a garment, uh, we're not going into any reprints right now. So uh, that was the, uh, the jewels of the Nizams. And these are some more images from that book. Then again, back to Tamil Nadu. And I had wanted to do a book on Chidambaram. When I had traveled through Tamil Nadu um, and did the Temple Towns book, uh, one of the places that I wanted to always go back to was Chidambaram. Not because of anything else. I mean, you know, Chidambaram, like most under. Uh, most other small towns is, 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 a, is a crowded, busy, bustling settlement. But there were some very unique aspects to that place. And, and the, 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 how do I say, the, the energy uh, of Chidambaram was something that really reached out to me. And um, they have a very different structure in terms of the way the temple is governed and organized and the priests. And, and they had these, you know, these wonderful, they have these Ved Patshalas where they teach young children to recite the Vedas who then subsequently become priests. And, and these kids were, you know, reciting uh, in the halls of the temple. And, you know, this was just like a little outside, you know, the traditional uh, Agraharam streets in, in Srinangam, in Chidambaram, sorry. And then this was like a, like the car festival, you know, the chariot festival. And then these are these kids singing, which was resonating inside those halls. Uh, in, in the most unbelievably, you know, uh, incredible way. It, it, it brings goose pimples, you know, even now when I think about it or I talk about it, uh, it was a very powerful and very moving experience. Um, here are some more images of, of, the, uh, of the temple. Uh, again, with the, with the, the young uh, priests all learning uh, to chant the Vedas. Uh, so it was quite a, a lot of them, of course, looked at me with great suspicion, but I, I, made, I made friends with all of them. I mean, they were just amazing people. Again, climbing the Gopuram, for example, in, in Chidambaram this time uh, was another spectacular experience. You can see that golden, uh, you know, roof of the, of the Sanctum Sanctorum and, and, you know, again, aerial shots. 
the, the likes of which we cannot get today because nobody is going to allow us up into the courtrooms anymore. So some of these pictures are actually quite priceless. I need to make sure that I can you know, scan them all properly and put them into some kind of an archive and make them available to the world. Uh, it's a work in progress. It's not easy sometimes to catch up with your past, but it's something that I really need to do. Again, some more images of the temple and the surroundings. The great tank. All the concentric walls and courtyards. I mean, the, the architecture of these places and the way they've been planned, it's just so spectacular. It was so um, enlightening. It was so, you know, uh, I, I couldn't get enough. It was, it was satisfying my photography. It was satisfying my, my, my passion for architecture. And it was just, uh, you know, it, it was offering me so much. And sometimes it used to be very difficult, you know, what do I, you know, for many years I used to wonder, you know, should I get back into architecture? No, should I stay in photography? But I stayed on in photography and I'm happy I did. Then came again, now Bombay Gothic. Uh, this is a book. Uh, I think uh, some of you are familiar with. It was with Dr. Christopher London, who also became a good friend. And uh, we traveled a little bit around India together. But, you know, Bombay has a spectacular collection, possibly one of the finest collection of neo-Gothic buildings in the world, uh, in any one city. And uh, it, was, it was, again, a, a wonderful uh, opportunity to travel around and, and rediscover the city uh, of my childhood, so to speak. But this time with a camera and a and a clear agenda of where to go and what to do and you know with the appropriate permissions permissions were difficult even in those days to be honest i mean everybody used to look at us very suspiciously because when you walk around with a big camera and a tripod uh, you know the, the the first reaction in in india is always no what are you doing you know so uh, it was not easy but through a little bit of you know convincing and cajoling and you know sweet talking people one managed to get access into a lot of the projects then came this amazing uh, opportunity to photograph Elephanta. Um, again, the six century rock cut temples on the island of Elephanta were just, you know, out of this world. They were spectacular. These, both these books actually, Bombay Gothic as well as Elephanta, was part of a series which started with a book on Ajanta and Elora. It was called In and Around Ajanta and Elora. Unfortunately, I don't have any pictures of that, but that was for the Maharashtra tourism. And that began a series of these small books, which were called the India series. And uh, we did this, uh, uh, the one on Bombay Gothic, and then we did the uh, Elephanta. Um, so these were small kind of handy guidebooks. And this was also with George Michel. So it was, a, again, it was every project for me has been an incredible learning experience. And to be honest, a lot of the projects that I've actually taken on have actually been projects which I wanted to know more about or learn about. Uh, it wasn't, you know, I wasn't kind of falling back on the safety of only going to places that I knew about or only taking on things that I was comfortable with. The, the more the discomfort, the more the, you know, feeling of being completely lost uh, in, in a place, uh, the, the, the more exciting it was for me because it was uh, this continuous process of discovery, this continuous search, you know, of what is this place? What is it, what, you know, what makes it tick? Who were the people who built this? Why do people still come there? Why is it still such a powerful place? So Elephanta for me was just, a, and, and those of you who haven't been to Elephanta and who happen to live in Bombay, please go, please go. Uh, it is quite a spectacular experience. It is a beautifully hewn out of the rock. Uh, you know, these caves uh, just, you know, uh, they, they contain the masterpieces of architectural design and masterpieces of sculpture. Um, you know, the, the figures, in Elephanta are some of the most beautiful I have ever seen. And I'll share with you some pictures of some, some faces, uh, but even the columns and the pillars and the way they were shaped. And then of course, the sculptures, the incredible sculptures inside Elephanta were, you know, they were, they were mesmerizing because they were the kind of sculptures which you sit in front of and you can't take your eyes off. It's almost impossible to tear yourself away from it because through the day, uh, the light penetrates those caves um, in a completely different way. So the sculpture actually takes on 
entirely different qualities um, and different, you know, uh, the, the, the stone takes on different colors, you know, um, the textures are highlighted at different times of the day. Sometimes it becomes a little bit more glossy. Sometimes it's not so glossy, but, but it, the light was just magical inside the place, of course, and the sculptures. And, and you know, this, this, this Trimurti, this Shiva uh, head is in fact, more, you know, one of the most beautiful sculptures I have ever seen. One of the most beautiful heads. So there's a lot more of these. I've just put some together to show you all the, the range and diversity of these faces. Unfortunately, like I, you know, some of them of course have been, you know, chipped away or broken, but a large part of them are very intact, uh, apart from just being worn out because of the weather. A large part of them are in very good condition. It's really worth a, a, a full day outing from Bombay. And it's really, it's close by. This is a good time to go, by the way, winter, because it's not too hot. And, uh, you know, the boat ride is pleasant and you, you get across to Elephanta. And, uh, you know, you have to climb those steps a little bit. But, you know, even that is not so bad uh, when the weather is cooler. Then again, I was approached to do another book on Indian design. Um, this was in 2002 now. Uh, we were, I was approached by Daab, uh, which is a publishing house in Germany, uh, to do, because they wanted some photographs actually. They came to me for some pictures of contemporary design in India, uh, contemporary architecture and design. And um, to be honest, by the time the first meeting ended between them and me, uh, they were so confident that I could handle the project that they literally handed over the entire project to me. And what I did again, like the earlier one, was to, uh, you know, make phone calls to all my friends and colleagues. And fortunately, you know, a lot of my friends and colleagues happened to be architects and designers. So I knew the ones who were doing good work and I, would, I contacted all of them and I said, look, guys, I'm going to be doing this. And of course, it was, you know, always open house. I was more than welcome to come and, and browse through their work and see the work that they were doing. And, and but, but what was spectacular about this book was not only was it handed over to me, which will be curated, but we had to actually sequence all the pictures inside the book and we were given a kind of a template. And then we had to upload. Now, this was like very unusual for that time. I'm talking 2002, when we were uploading something like 11 or 12 gigabytes of uh, press-ready artworks uh, to their servers in Stuttgart so that they could then take the book to print. Um, you know, there was no, I mean, you know, courier services and stuff, but, you know, there were too many CDs and basically they wanted it all in a hurry. And believe it or not, from Madras at that time, in 2002, uh, it took me a couple of days to upload, but we managed to upload, uh, you know, 10 gigabytes of data. And, uh, you know, um, so much for broadband internet. Um, it was, it was, uh, you know, suddenly became indispensable, I think, for everybody. Um, soon after the DAB project uh, in 2005, we decided to start our own publishing venture, uh, a kind of a publishing division within our own setup. Because until then, I was just doing photography, and the more I reached out to people for photography, the more I realized that, you know, uh, people. Uh, we're looking for all kinds of, uh, you know, uh, services and, you know, we, we took that opportunity and basically we positioned ourselves as a visual communications company and publishing became a large part of what we were doing at that time. And I had the opportunity to photograph uh, Falak Numa. Uh, Falak Numa in Hyderabad um, was the first book that we did under the graph banner. And I had managed to get access into the palace uh, during the late 90s, actually. And using these pictures, which I had a few of, uh, I have approached Princess Ezra herself uh, through her lawyers. And uh, she was extremely excited and she gave me a carte blanche access to the palace. And she said, do it because I said, I want to do a book. And she said, please go ahead, you're more than welcome. But the only problem was that the palace had been largely unoccupied and had been semi-abandoned for almost 95 years at that time. And since the last Nizam had ostensibly died within its walls, it was kind of left derelict and left the way it was. And when I, get, when I got hold of the keys and I managed to get the doors open, 
it completely overwhelmed me because it was like some European, you know, uh, I don't know, yeah, European paradise. I, it was like a, like a European palace. It was frozen in time. But with all the richness and the decoration that the richest man in the world at that time, the Nizam of Hyderabad, could desire and could afford. But we had to go in armed with dusters and brooms and we spent hours cleaning the place before we could complete each shot. Uh, not only the, the dust and the, the cobweb, but even the fabrics, you know, were, were just falling apart. If we touched one of those draperies, they would just crumble in our hands. So we had to be very, very careful while photographing it. But this visual documentation that I managed to do uh, of the palace. Um, actually, I managed to complete it before the Taj group uh, took over. Uh, the, the Taj had already kind of taken it on lease, so uh, I was always worried that they would start their work anytime. But fortunately for me, I, I finished my work before they went in. And uh, you know, soon after I kind of finished all the photography part of it, uh, they went in and started restoring the place. And of course, now, you know, uh, it's converted into a super luxury hotel. But I was really lucky. I was very, very fortunate before the remodeling and the re uh, you know, restoration that I managed to get in and shoot it. But subsequently, then I had to put the book together. Uh, and then we were, we were looking for fund and we managed to get some funds. And, and lo and behold, a French interior designer, uh, you know, offered, uh, you know, to help us to fund the project. And uh, it was incredible because, um, we did the book, and then when I took the book to the Taj, just about maybe six months before their launch uh, of the palace, I took the book to them as a PDF, as a dummy, and I shared it with them, and they got so excited that actually uh, they bought the entire first print run, and Ratan Tata himself used the book to launch the palace. And, uh, you know, it was a huge privilege because uh, my wife and myself, were, we were invited for the opening uh, launch, and uh, the first copy of the book was actually uh, gifted to the last Nizam by Ratan Tata himself. And it was, it was, yeah, it was quite an experience. Um, but now it's a hotel and it's, uh, you know, from what I hear, it's doing exceptionally well. I haven't been back there for years, but uh, I'm sure, uh, you know, they're maintaining it and looking after it, uh, you know, really spectacularly. But these pictures are the last documentation of the palace before it was restored. So really, these images cannot be recreated anymore. If you can see, you can see patches in the carpet and stuff like that. All of that has been changed and replaced. You will see the drapes hanging off the walls. Uh, you know, we, I, I tried to be as careful as possible not to show too much of the damage, but uh, to a very large extent, it was still, you know, uh, eminently photographable. Very, very picturesque and very beautiful. the grand ballroom, all these tiles were coming off and we had to actually replace some of that parquet. We had to find the bits and pieces and then fit them back in like, like a jigsaw puzzle. These were the studies. One of the bedrooms. Of course, as you all might know, uh, the, the palace was never really used as a palace. The Nizam never lived there. It was used primarily as a guest house for visiting dignitaries and really, really important people would come and they would be uh, put up here. And that's the entrance gateway to the palace, which of course has been all spruced up and painted fresh now, but I love that old patina of what it used to look like. Again, the dining room, the, the ballroom, there's the great Darbar Hall with the two chairs, the ceilings. The next book uh, after that, uh, the next book uh, was a book on Rambak. Again, Rambak Palace. Uh, this was, uh, you know, commissioned by Titan. And this was another Taj Hotel, this time with a fascinating history of uh, hunting lodge to royal residence. But I managed to convince them to do a book celebrating not just the design of the palace, but as well as this the eternal romance between Jai and Gayatri Devi. And I felt that that was a very, uh, you know, strong, powerful element of the palace itself. And uh, the book was completed, uh, but sadly it never really got published. It never got published because, um, you know, Titan changed their mind and things changed, circumstances changed and uh, we complete. So we, we've got a complete book, but just a digital uh, version of it. And uh, 
uh, it never saw the light of day. Again, these are some images from inside. Then another book which I have been wanting to do for years uh, called The Mansions of Chetinad. Now, uh, some of you might have heard of Chetinad. Uh, it is this region in Tamil Nadu uh, near Madurai, uh, which is inhabited by uh, the Chetiar community primarily. Of course, now uh, very few people uh, actually live there. I mean, the, the Chetiar community is scattered around the world. They're an extremely successful community. They've been, you know, they've been bankers and they've, they've made the, you know, the businessmen and they live in different parts of the world, but the, the, the homes that they built, which were these palatial mansions in this region, are lying there almost, you know, so a lot of them are falling to bits, a lot of them are falling to ruin, a lot of them are derelict, a lot of them are just, you know, very poorly maintained because it costs a lot of money to maintain these huge places, and it's difficult to blame them, a lot of them are being dismantled and sold. But some of them are really maintained well and looked after. So we had to identify those families. And through doing this book, we thought, you know, maybe we can galvanize the Chetiar community into, into action and say, look, this is your heritage. This is something spectacular that you all own and possess. And this is something that once it goes, it's gone forever. You'll never be able to get it back. And we hope, we hope it has that kind of, uh, you know, effect on the people. Um, but our job was just to do the book, so we did it. Uh, we did it as a dual language edition, again, like Palaknuma. Uh, I didn't mention that earlier, but yeah, Palaknuma was a dual language edition because uh, I think amongst all the communities, all the people in the world, different countries, I think the French are people who have a great interest in India and who have, when they travel around India, they travel with a lot more, uh, how do I say, desire to learn and, and understand and, and contribute than, than most of the communities. I, the Germans also are very uh, involved with India in that sense. I mean, they're very scholarly, and stuff, but the, the French, the average French tourist is a completely a different animal from other, other tourists, you know, they, they, come, they come with a very, like a seriousness of intent and purpose. So uh, we decided that we would do it as a, as a dual language edition. Again, it was spectacular to work with George Michel there's very little bit of, of first-hand information available on these on these houses, but we managed to dig up quite a lot, and we had to identify uh, those houses which were still in in photographable condition, so that we could go in there. And just like in Palaknuma, we had to go in armed with a team of people sometimes because these houses are not occupied. Um, we had to go in armed with dusters and brooms and mops and clean the place and swap the place and wipe it up before we could actually do any photography. So each of these things was a really time consuming and very painstaking process. Um, you know, once we had the place clean, then we had to go back and actually start shooting. And, uh, but it was an incredible experience. It was, a, it was just so much fun to do, uh, interacting with those people, you know, taking those pictures and, 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 and then putting the book together. So here, just some more pictures of some of the houses, which is this, you know, the, 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 the unique thing about these mansions is that they have the unique, they all share this unique and very hybrid style of architecture, which pretty much does not exist anywhere else in the world. You will not find this anywhere because it's such a, a mix and match between different styles that these, uh, uh, the Chetiars, uh, they traveled the world and they came back with ideas and they tried to incorporate all their little, little ideas into their buildings, into their homes. And, and these were spectacular. I mean, these mansions were huge, uh, but beautifully detailed and exquisite woodwork. This is one of the earliest, in fact, the right-hand side picture is one of the earliest, um, you know, houses, possibly dating back more than 200 years now. the columns and the brackets, the capitals and the brackets, the stained glass, some of the newer mansions, the kind of entrance, you know, archway, that, you know, you, you walk through this beautifully carved kind of uh, elegant porch. Yeah, possibly the walls at the end have been built later uh, for security reasons. Uh, these would have possibly opened out straight onto the road in the old days. Then the large halls again with the beautifully vaulted roofs. But again, like in Kerala, these places have unbelievably spectacular woodwork. 
the, car, the quality of the carvings and the, the precision, and also the whimsical nature of some of these, uh, you know, places because they, uh, people have, you know, painted them gold and they painted colors and then the craft. And the people who've actually, you know, done that have left their little signatures. You'll find, a, a, you know, a, all kinds of crazy characters uh, painted onto the walls like this. One of the, again, one of the older mansions, the big, the great hall. One of the better maintained ones with the actually chandeliers uh, from Italy. The stone seats, which grace some of these entrances and solid block of stone, solid slabs of granite. And then the layered entrances. These homes primarily followed, uh, you know, the very uh, simple uh, principle uh, and layout of, of traditional Tamilian homes, uh, traditional Tamilian village houses. So they were not, they were, they were just, you know, uh, much larger scale. And of course, the, the quality of the woodwork and everything was far, far better. Uh, but primarily the principles on which they were based in terms of the verandas and the courtyards were you know, exactly the same as the traditional dwellings in Tamil Nadu. Making these pictures actually makes me want to go back again. I've not gone back for some time, but... Uh, and then, you know, some of the later mansions actually took on kind of art deco uh, uh, feel because, you know, some of these people traveled and then they must have seen uh, the art deco, uh, you know, boom in Bombay and places and they've come back and then they wanted to create an art deco version of the mansion for themselves. So this was one of the art deco mansions. And then the last book, the last book that we did uh, was called Humpy. And this is another place that I've been going to for years, uh, almost for the last 15, maybe more longer. And uh, it has always drawn me back. There's something spectacular about Humpy, something very special, something very sacred and powerful about Humpy, which kept drawing me back. And, and you know, I've been wanting to do a book on Humpy and of course, uh, Dr. George Michel and John Fritz were, you know, the, the de facto, the, the definitive people to speak to about the book because they've done so many books and so much work on Humpy. So I approached them and of course, you know, we, we teamed up again and uh, we decided to do this book together. And we managed to get William Dalrymple to come with me to Humpy and write the foreword for it. So it was, again, it was a great fun experience, a, you know, great opportunity to, to photograph this spectacular site uh, of Vijayanagara with, 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 the, with the monuments and the rocks and this, uh, you know, almost surreal uh, landscape. There's some of the, some of the pictures of Hampi. This book is still available on Amazon. Uh, so if, uh, if, in fact, both the mansions of Chetinada as well as uh, the Hampi book are both available on Amazon. So if anybody wants to, uh, buy them. Uh, it's a good time to buy the Humpy book because it's being offered at a good discount. Uh, the Chetnad book is still a little bit on the expensive side, but it's really worth buying these two things because you know what? These books, they, these places are not going to last indefinitely. And Humpy already now with tourism, you know, is, is already showing signs of wear and tear. Uh, you know, 15 years ago, there, nobody came to Humpy. In fact, Humpy was almost unreachable. Uh, even 10 years ago, uh, it's only now in the last three, four years, five years uh, after uh, all these highways have been built that people have been, you know, uh, uh, the travel and tourism has exploded in this country. And uh, uh, at any given moment during the summer months, you have, you know, maybe 200 million, million people on the move around the country. That's a lot. And, and whatever said and done, even if people don't wantonly damage, it's just the numbers. The numbers is what causes uh, the wear and tear. And there's nothing one can do about it, I guess. One of the, you know, spectacular views of the landscape. Again, with the, the shrine on top of the hill, on top of the rocks. From on top of Matanga Hill. And 
Tungabhadra River flowing through this through through Hampi itself. That's a Virupaksha temple looking down from the hillside again. A lot of people tend to ask me why are there no people in your pictures? <laughs> because it's it's difficult, you know, it's difficult because many times I do very long exposures. So people, unless they are kind of frozen uh, and standing still, very still, uh, they tend to get completely blurred out. So you don't really see them. Uh, but on the other hand, also, you know, the average Indian tourist is not particularly a photogenic <laughs> uh, presence in, 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 in these images. So uh, generally I prefer to avoid because afterwards then you need to kind of system out. So, so one has to be very patient. To, you can imagine, you know, you have to be really patient and wait and wait and wait for you, the opportunity. And you have to wait for everything to come together. You know, no people, the light has to be right. The sky has to be right. What used to always amaze me about this place was the scale of those rocks and the boulders. You know, these look at this, this little lingam shrine across the along the riverbank. Uh, you know, with these lingams carved into this huge rock. And every one of these places becomes a little point for worship. The tank of the main Virupaksha temple in Hampi. So this, this, this kind of ends the book, so to speak. Um, but what I am going to do is, is uh, just run through a few pictures with you all uh, before we wind up to share with you all some of the like projects which I want to do still, a project which I've been wanting to do for a long time, but for some reason they haven't come about. Um, there are actually three projects which I'm going to share with you. Uh, three, uh, just a few pictures from each of these. Um, so if anybody has any ideas about how I can get a book put together for this, let me know. Uh, but I would love to uh, do a book, firstly, on Fatehpur Sikri. Um, I don't know how many of you all have been there, but it's not very far from Agra. But it's one of the most beautifully preserved, uh, you know, capital cities of the ancient world. Um, built by Emperor Akbar. Uh, he called it the City of Victory. Um, it was eventually abandoned because of, I think, water issues. But uh, it, it is one of the most beautifully uh, maintained. It was, of course, restored, I think, in the late 19th century, if I'm not mistaken, by the British for some reason. And um, I can't remember the name of the gentleman, but he was an archaeologist who, you know, uh, spearheaded the restoration. But subsequent to that, it's been really very well looked after because it's one of the World Heritage Sites of India. And uh, the, the people who are looking after the place have kept it impeccably. Of course, the ASI is involved. Uh, the ASI has been doing an incredible job. Uh, you know, despite a lot of people tend to ban off the ASI, but they have an unforgiving uh, job in front of them. And it's, it's not even a, you know, it's a, it's a tough one because they're always short of funds. And, you know, the, the proliferation of monuments and beautiful buildings in India, and, you know, every street corner, there's a monument worth preserving. And how do you even begin? Where do you start? I mean, it's a question, obviously, they grapple with. But these are, you know, this is a World Heritage Site and it's a, uh, it's very, very special. It's really worth a visit. All built in red sandstone, exquisitely carved. Even those tiles on the on the on the on the roof are, are carved from the sandstone slabs. Almost all the pictures that you'll have seen so far have all been shot actually on film, huh? uh, on the old cameras. It's not, uh, I haven't, maybe some of the, some of the Chetinard pictures and some of the Humpy pictures were digital, but otherwise these are all, uh, you know, you can tell by the format that they were all uh, shot on the view camera, on the large format. And uh, it's something that I wish we could go back to because uh, there was a certain, um, how do I say, meditative quality to photography, which uh, unfortunately has been lost.
the great Bulan Darwaza. I mean, the scale of that gate, if you see the people down at, it, <laughs> at its base, it's unbelievable. It's just so powerful and beautiful. One of the other gateways leading into the, the Jama Masjid, inside the large courtyard of the Jama Masjid, and of course, this, the famous Salim Chisti's tomb. Exquisitely carved in white marble and placed strategically kind of off center in that courtyard, but occupying it like you, you're really with, with such a strong presence. Then this is an, uh, this, the other book that I want to do, uh, which we started doing actually, but for some very you know, different reasons, we kind of didn't, we weren't able to continue, but I would love to, before it changes dramatically and it cannot, uh, is Pondicherry. Uh, Pondicherry, uh, you know, I lived a few years in, in Madras, um, you know, during the early part of uh, 2000, maybe 2002, 2003, till about 2010. And during that time, we visit Pondicherry regularly. And I, you know, I used to want, Really, especially the the, the, the Franco Tamil architecture and the Tamil homes uh, in Pondicherry were very very special, and I really felt that it was something worth documenting before uh, they all fell apart or they were demolished and you know rebuilt into apartments. Because Pondicherry, like like all other places in India, is growing at a very rapid pace, and you know the value of land and you know the value of these places. Sadly, you know, people find it very difficult to maintain them and, uh, you know, they'd rather get it, you know, give the land to some developer builder who will pull it all down and, you know, sell the parts in some antique shop. But the, you know, an ugly monstrosity of an apartment block will come up in its place. And that's my biggest, you know, that's, that's something that I, I watch by the sidelines as a photographer. And I really lament the fact that, you know, we in India just don't value heritage and value our, our traditions and our culture the way uh, we should you know there's some there's a kind of a uh, a disdain almost for it it's almost like a like a care a devil may care attitude you know i have fought with young people who uh, you know deface walls in some of these monuments i had a, a big fight with a group of young students from college who were carving their names on you know in agra fort for example on the wall i mean just it, it drives me crazy but you know there's you know little one one person can do but i think i think everybody if uh, if we collectively decide that we are not going to tolerate uh, that kind of defacement or that kind of behavior uh, we need to speak up because uh, Nobody else is going to do it for you. We become, it's strange, you know, because we, in India we become tolerant about all the wrong things and we become intolerant about all the wrong things. It's a strange kind of paradox we find ourselves in. Um, we've got a wires crossed somewhere down the line. But these houses were absolutely exquisite. They had such a wonderful sense of, you know, a timelessness about them. And this was a, a, a one that was kind of restored very lovingly by this French couple who were living over there. Um, I think they were just renting the place, but they were there for a long time. But very beautifully done. So this is one of the old houses again now, which has been gutted and which has been abandoned. And obviously, you know, I don't know what happened to it subsequently because I photographed it just as an empty shell. I thought it was so beautiful, the proportions, the, the scale, the quality of the light was so lovely. And, uh, you know, it was in pretty good shape. So I wonder uh, whether they have actually restored it or left it the way it was. And then we come to Bombay, <laughs> home sweet home. I always, I, I still consider Bombay my home. And, and, you know, Bombay is one of the places which I've been wanting to do a book on for a long, long time. Apart from, from Bombay to Mumbai, uh, we, uh, you know, I, like I said, uh, you know, I spent my childhood in the city, wandering around the city. And, uh, uh, you know, I, we, friends and myself, we used to take our cameras and go around on the weekends and photograph, you know, places. 
and it was always interesting because it was it was it was rarely people who interested me. It was always the monuments, it was buildings, it was architecture, it was the incredible sense of design and detailing. And of course, you know, Bombay is just you know it's an incredible collection of beautiful buildings. And and you know, I've been wanting to do a book, but uh, you know, the, when I used to approach publishers to do a book with some of these pictures uh, and say, look, let's do a book on Bombay on the architecture of the city, and they would say, oh, but there are already two books of the city, and I'm like. Two books on the city. I said, do you know how many books there are on London or New York or Paris? I mean, you know, in Paris, there are like hundreds of books on Paris. Why does Bombay have to be satisfied with only two? Let's do more. Let's do more. But unfortunately, well, you know, then I left Bombay and then I've been traveling around and now I live in Goa. I'd still love to do something on Bombay, but, you know, I don't know. Let's see if the opportunity comes my way. But in the meantime, I have these beautiful old pictures, which were shot many, many, many years ago. Um, the grand old lady of Bombay, Flora herself. I mean, it's just so beautiful. The, the fountain, the sculptures, uh, the way that whole configuration, you know, sits there, you know, the way her, her stance, the way she's standing, the elegance, the poise. It communicates so much about that city. And then all these diverse, you know, trades, people from that region, who've been featured on the fountain itself. And then we come to, uh, you know, the buildings in that area and walking around and just photographing small details. I mean, that's, uh, you know, I used to, I used to photograph just the details because I used to always think to myself, you know, one day I'll come back and photograph the whole building when I'm able to uh, with a proper tripod and stuff like that. But uh, unfortunately that was not to happen. But now I feel that possibly a book, um, like, you know, Venkatesh had given this talk some time ago, which he had titled uh, Looking, Look Up Bombay or something, Looking Up Bombay, I can't remember. But basically, even I feel very strongly that people in Bombay walk around with their eyes downcast, primarily because they're worried about tripping on some pavement which has not been finished or, you know, the, the, the walking around Bombay is an obstacle course. And, and so people don't get an opportunity to stop and look up. But you know what, if you do look up, spend the time on Sunday, maybe when there's not too much of crowd and you're not rushing from one location to another, stop and start looking up and look around you. And you will see some of the most exquisite architecture, craftsmanship and detailing you will see anywhere in the world. famous peacock window. I think all of you will be familiar with, but you know, a lot of this is VT in that, it's all in the fort area, basically. This is the entrance to the Sassoon Library and the left-hand side is the base of the Rajabai Tower. I mean, the Sassoon Library itself is such a beautiful building, such a beautiful space. Uh, the left-hand side is some, you know, the vaults and the, the, the uh, uh, I, I forget what it's called, the technical term for it, but it's in the, uh, in the in, inside the dome of the Victoria Terminus on the left or rather the Chhatrapati Shivaji terminus. And on the right is the inside of the Afghan church. I still use the old words, old names. I'm, I'm sorry, I, uh, I, I unfortunately, I'm not familiar enough with all the new uh, names and stuff that people have dubbed these places. On the left is a is a column bracket is a column capital I found actually in the JJ School of Art, uh, which actually portrays uh, you know people drawing and craftsmen and you know this guy is sitting on the ground with a with a with a slate and a tablet and he's drawing something. I mean this is all from the JJ and of course the right hand side is from the circle ornament circle, the buildings around the ornament circle. Chhatrapati Shivaji Terminus again, the incredible gargoyles and the decorative reliefs. So I come to an end uh, of my journey, but like I said, 
uh, it has not come to an end. It's a far way, long, long way from completion. I've still got lots of things to do and lots of things to share and lots of, I, I still feel that it's a, it's an incredibly exciting time to be alive and there's lots of opportunities to do things. And uh, I'm always looking at opportunities. Sorry? Yeah, so I'm always looking for opportunities to create new books or, you know, uh, uh, find new places to photograph and, uh, you know, uh, so, uh, yeah, yeah. So uh, thank you very much, all of you. Uh, I think I'll end there. I think it's been a long session, uh, one hour and 10 minutes. I never imagined that it would go by so quickly. I always thought it was like, a, oh, I was really stressed about it, but uh, I hope you all enjoyed the images and uh, I... Venkatesh, I think over to you, my friend. Thank you, sir. Thank you. That was awesome. It was totally awesome. Thank so, you. Thank you. Absolutely fine. So, sir, with your permission, uh, we will take some questions. We have uh, 20 minutes time. Sure. And sure. Uh, we request the audience to please put it on the chat and uh, I will read it out to you. Sure. So I, I, it's been really amazing. Actually, you've answered two questions which I had in mind. So, uh, so uh, I was going to use my privilege, privilege of being the co-host to uh, ask the first question, but you've already answered uh, both of my questions. So it was an, uh, one was on the change between film to digital. You know, how did it really affect you, and what do you think about it? So yeah. you've already answered that. And the second one was on the difficulty of access and the locations and all that, which, yeah. which is uh, primarily something that we all face. So yeah, yeah, yeah. it's uh, it's become a big problem nowadays. You know, access uh -huh. because everybody looks at you as if you're some spy or something. You know, everybody there's this suspicion. You know, always. You know, and in the old days, you could actually talk to people, and uh, you know, you could talk to a watchman, and he would give you access, and nobody yes. would question it. You know, yes. Today, yes. everybody's so scared of their jobs, and everybody's so scared of answering to the higher ups and authorities, and. And, you know, the first reaction to anything, you approach people for anything in India, and the first reaction is no. Then you have to sit and cajole them and convince them and talk to them and explain to them. And then, and if you're really lucky, and if that person is in a slightly good mood, they might say yes. But even that, it will come with riders and it will come with all kinds of conditions and it will come. So it's become, you know, I don't know why photography uh, is looked upon as such an evil thing in this country. Because, uh, you know, I mean, you go, even photographing airports till recently was, was taboo. I mean, photographing railway stations is still, I think, a problem. You can't photograph on a bridge. And I, you know, I don't, I mean, you know, with Google Maps and Google Earth and stuff like that, you can, you have resolutions of one meter by one meter. You know, what are they, go, what are they going to show uh, people which, which, you know, the world is not seeing anyway. Mm. So it's a difficult thing. It's a difficult thing. I hope attitudes change. I hope people get, I think, I don't know whether it's born of insecurity or where it comes from, to be honest, but I think it's it's partly, it's, it's the hierarchy of, you know, like, you know, the, the, everybody wants to be boss and everybody wants to make oh. decisions. And yeah. their way of showing their power is to say no. So that's kind of, you know, and that's where it ends, unfortunately. Well, as as, uh, true, sir, because uh, when uh, I have had this experience so many times, you know, once at the... Uh, uh, once at Kingsway Camp, when where King George V statues there in Delhi, I you know those days were camera days, yeah, uh, film yeah. camera days. You know they said, "Aap kuch ja ke publish kar doge kahin par." <laughs> first, first thing they suspect you're a journalist. Yeah, Second yeah. thing, uh, they suspect that you will publish so it somewhere. Yeah, and so uh, today, the fear that people have is everything will go on social media with a negative comment and we'll get into trouble. Yeah. As uh, late as uh, December 25th, which is uh, which is some days ago. Yeah. Uh, even at a functional church in Thane where I went uh, to, to attend uh, uh, a Christmas morning uh, visit. Yeah. So there also I was shooed away once and yeah. uh, several places it ha it's happened. But strangely enough, if you go with a mobile phone, nobody says anything. This if is you exactly. go with a camera, then uh, yeah. you have the entire world after you. Well, the, and... <laughs> the, it's, it's really funny because if you're, if you're out in the, on the ASI sites, for example, any of the sites that's managed by ASI, if you don't carry a tripod, you can take the most sophisticated yes. DSLR and shoot. Yes. Okay. Yes. Even in pitch darkness nowadays, you can shoot handheld with a DSLR. Yes. Whereas in a city, 
the, the, the sight of a camera itself brings people, you know, get them all stressed. So I'm looking forward to acquiring the new iPhone 12 and then subsequently any other iPhone model which comes out because, you know what, if I can eliminate, uh, you know, having to carry a camera around in a city environment and do all the photography with just a phone, wow, wonderful. I think it would be, so I, those are the advantages of digital. I guess it kind of allows you to circumvent certain, you know, inane uh, laws and, and, and kind of attitudes. But, you know, uh, I, I still miss film. I, I miss the texture of film. I miss that the process of photography, which was a far more, like I mentioned, uh, a meditative one. It was a slow process. It was something that you took time over. And you had to, you had no choice. And But, but it was that which allowed you to really see and understand what you were photographing. So my question also was stemming from the same fact. Uh, see, in digital, one has an enormous amount of uh, capability in doing touch-ups, uh, adding a few clouds, removing a stray uh, piece of yeah. garbage and yeah. from the foreground and stuff like that, which, which many people seem to prefer. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But uh, uh, many of us do seem to remember the old film days. So uh, yeah. what value uh, or, you know, the, in, in terms of uh, percentage or in terms of, uh, uh, you know, value add to a visual image would you give to post uh, uh, production processing, as in well, the, you know, know, the heavy editing. I, I, I have a, a one-liner that I use. I always I tell people, you know what, in the old days, we used to think and then shoot. Today, people shoot and then think. You know, it's really the, the process has become uh, inverted, right? So now, look, I, I'll tell you, uh, to be very honest, I use digital. I use digital cameras all the time. I do a lot of processing. We do a lot of retouching. But I guess it all depends on the kind of photography you're doing and what those images are meant for. Uh, if, if you're a photojournalist, for example, you can't doctor images. You can't, you know, you have to, uh, at least you have this claim that you are showing the truth of what's happening. But you know what? The truth is again become so, uh, how do I say, subjective. Yeah, different people have different truths nowadays. And, uh, you know, two people reporting the same event will have completely different opinions of it. And I think even for, as photographers, I think different people will have different ways of looking at things. So I think today we've reached a point where, you know, digital photography uh, is become, well, I, I, I joke to people, I say, you know, photographs always lie. Uh, because you never really know what the truth was, you know, you never really know what actually was photographed, because at the end of the day, what it ends up being is so dramatically different from what was actually captured, or ca what was actually the, the photograph that was made, that, uh, you know, sometimes it's almost impossible to tell them uh, that they come from the, the, the same picture. So, you know, it's, I guess we have to go through that process. I don't know. I, you know, uh, it's a, Look, you can't stop technology. You can't stop the development of technology. And today, photography itself, you know, I call it the democratization of photography. The very fact that everybody has a, has a camera today, I think it's a wonderful thing. Because I think photography has this ability to really uh, allow people to view the world differently. Uh, but only if they slow down and take their time uh, you know, if they if they make the effort uh, to slow down and look around them, uh, then a, a come entirely different relationship with their your surroundings. You know, you can uh, build. Uh, but unfortunately, this you know we live in the jatpat instant gratification world, and you know it's difficult to say where things are going. You know, I I I kind of take it all with a pinch of salt uh, because you know even like I said, you know I also uh, you know have uh, you know digital cameras and I shoot digitally because, you know, you can't do anything else for now. And we process all the picture, but I try and keep it within, you know, just the, you know, necessary uh, corrections uh, uh, rather than really going to town and changing everything. But then look, if you're an artist and, and you know, a lot of photographers like to be called artists now, you know, there's like this whole thing about, you know, I am, I'm an artist, I'm not a photographer. I mean, okay. But as an artist, you have complete freedom to do whatever you want with the picture. So then you cease to be a photographer. You're an artist. You're creating anything fresh, new. You can change anything. You can do whatever you want. So 
look, I think I think all of this is there are lots of gray areas in this whole thing, and I think I think ultimately it's to each person to be, take a call for themselves in terms of what they want to do and uh, the integrity that they want to approach their work and their profession or their career, whatever it might be. And ultimately, the 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 long term, uh, how do I say, the application of those images, you know. Where are those images going to be used? You know, how are they going to be used? What they're going to be used for? Uh, ultimately, it's about communication. So, what are they communicating? What are they saying? What's the storyline? Uh, what are the narratives? And there are a lot of young photographers who are doing, uh, you know, who are being very true to their craft, who are being very true to their art, and creating beautiful photo books and stuff like that. So, there's look. I think I think the world is made up of so many different mm. types. So, there's all of it is there. So. There's, place, there's place for it. Yes, sir. So there are a few questions and some uh, awesome comments. I'll just take them one by one. Sure. Uh, 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 my friend Isa has a comment and a question. Sir, these are brilliant. I have always been your fan. Small query, what camera do you use and what would you recommend for starters? So for starters, get any camera. It doesn't really matter. Uh, because ultimately, it's not the camera is just a tool. Look, the camera is like buying a pencil, you know. Uh, ultimately, it's what you draw. Um, and I think it, it's entirely based on the person, uh, you know. So the ca what, you, what camera you own doesn't matter at all. Uh, it, it, you buy a simple basic DSLR uh, within your price budget and, and use it. Uh, I use Nikons. I have been using Nikons exclusively for the last 40 years now. Uh, I still have you know, very old lenses and optics, which I use with the latest digital bodies. And that's the great thing about Nikon because they have created a system, uh, which is also uh, kind of reverse engineered. So it's kind of, you know, it, it, it backward compatible. So it works with their older equipment as well. So nothing gets, uh, you know, and Nikon has served me really well. I mean, I'm using the, the 800, 810, 850, uh, you know, I haven't switched to mirrorless as yet, but that, you know, I don't see the need for me to do that. Uh, uh, I enjoy shooting, and I'm I'm very familiar with the system, and I uh, yeah, so I use Nikon's primarily. Okay, and the next any, question, any camera, yeah, fantastic. The next uh, uh, is from Rotarian Santosh. Excellent images, sir. Just wondering how I can click such pictures when tripod is not allowed now. <laughs> you can click. You just have to find it. You have to look for it. You have to. Stand in one place and spend your time looking at it, and 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 support your camera with your with your hands and your hold your camera correctly, you know, prop your elbows against your chest, and and you'll create your own you know tripod effectively, and uh, or stabilize yourself against a, a tree or a pillar or uh, you know lean against something which is a you know a, a, a place your camera up on a rock. You, I mean, there's so many ways of doing it and working around it, but. You can even shoot handheld. I mean, you know, most pictures you can shoot nowadays handheld unless you're shooting in pitch darkness. Uh, then there are two uh, uh, very awesome um, compliments. One is from Darpana, which is uh, uh, which says Bharat and it's got uh, emoticons. And from Urvashi, brilliant, each picture worth a thousand, me a million words. Uh, a question, uh, the next one is from Rufus. Uh, you raised a point. As a country, we do not respect our monuments of our past. From where does this come? So, from where does it come? I think, I think you know, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't put it down to like a bad attitude or anything. I just think it's about the proliferation of, of heritage that we have in this country. Look, we are rich and diverse, and look, every street corner there are monuments. You know, like I said, you know. Uh, the thing is, we become a little blasé about it. We become a little, we take it for granted. We take these places for granted. And we don't position them and market them the way they do in the West, you know. Uh, you know, if, if uh, uh, people, people don't seem to realize the kind of time and effort and money it takes to maintain these places. And, and, and when, when people uh, don't respect that, uh, and they, they treat, uh, you know, places with scant disrespect to the people who are working there. And yeah, everybody is facing that then. Because, so I, I, I really believe that it's, it, I think it's an, it's an educational pro process that has to start from childhood, from schools, uh, you know, to respect your surroundings, to respect your environment, and for people to understand this. It's not rocket science, really. It's something that can be taught in school. And I think, uh, you know, if it's taught in school, it can, it, you know, people can grow up with, with the right attitudes towards these things, right value towards them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, the next uh, comment is from Rotarian Santosh. Uh, true, unfortunately, we were not taught about many dynasties like Hampi, Chola, etc. So nobody knows the value. 
and uh, uh, isa has also uh, commented sure sir thank you so much your humble person has reflected in your work so these are the chats on the screen uh, i would request the audience to put any more questions on the chat we still have about 6 7 minutes so uh, we can kind of uh, you know uh, you know use this time for some more q and a audience uh, please do put any more questions if you have Uh, if any any one of you can you know feel free to uh, reach out uh, to me also directly uh, venkatesh will share my email as well and if anybody wants uh, you know to get in touch with me regarding anything related to photography or related to you know doing books and stuff like that uh, you know i'm 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 only too happy to share uh, any knowledge uh, any experiences that i might have had uh, it's something that i I've always shared. I mean, the reason I do books is because I want to share everything that I see. So uh, you know, each book has become a, a an incredible learning experience, and uh, you know, uh, I hope it continues as mm. long as I possibly can. Uh, there are two more questions. Uh, Ankur has asked, "Do we still get film roles in the market?" You have started getting again now, uh, but just color negative and black and white. but you can get now and there are people who are actually developing these roles now processing black and white and processing color and and both i i know in delhi in bombay in madras uh, all these in bangalore uh, there are places in the smaller towns maybe you will have little difficulty but you can in the cities now and i think it's a uh, it's something that is catching on a lot of young photographers are slowly uh, trying to rediscover that magic of, of photography uh, through mm. film you know because really it was magical Uh, the process of taking a picture and then seeing that image converted into a into a transparency or a print, uh, you know, a, every step every step of the way, including the actual taking of the picture, was a magical process. You know, who said magic doesn't exist? You know, magic was there all the time, and it continues even today. Uh, you know, when you stand in front of a monument, even if you're just holding a cell phone in your hand, and if you are sensitive to the light and you're sensitive to you can wait and be patient and wait and you will see magic unfold in front of you it's this this every day brings magic to our lives udayan sir yes. says awesome way to spend an hour and a half thank you and uh, some uh, people have requested your email as you offered and uh, there is one uh, question from rufus uh, what about international projects which ones have impressed you Inter sorry international projects would i be yeah what about what about international projects which yeah. ones have impressed you impressed me my god i you know there's a there's an incredible amount of amazing photography going on around the world uh you know uh, and in terms of restoration and looking after old buildings and monuments there's nothing to compare with the british i think uh, you know the the british whatever said and done uh, you know uh, they 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 are masters at restoration and conservation and they've been doing it for years and they have you know there is there are the, the the heritage societies and they're all very active they're well funded and they maintain a lot of beautiful buildings so there's a lot of you know in france in germany all these places unfortunately look the kind of the 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 range and diversity of buildings that they have is nothing compared to ours and we have you know because of all the our tumultuous past and you know you know ranging from you know dynasty upon dynasty and then the moguls and then you know whatever uh and then the british you know we we've gone through a process of uh, you know uh, absorption assimilation so a lot of it, you know stuff has made way for the new every time it's made way for the new so and i think even in our own minds um there is this this philosophical you know concept in india that you know we, we everything is cyclical time you know life and death and you know that the time has come for these buildings so let them go gracefully why are we holding on to them is is one argument huh? um because how much can you hold on to so we have to be very selective in terms of what we hold on to but i think in comparison to what's happening in the rest of the world it's difficult to compare uh i think that great projects happening in different parts i mean you know restoration projects photography great photographers i mean my inspiration uh you know earlier on in photography has always been because of the great uh, masters of photography and uh, you know even the great architects who've done amazing work so uh, i think we look outside okay. for inspiration that's okay and uh, 
uh, I have a question again. Uh, uh, in, in, in places like Elephanta, for example, uh, in that awesome book, which we refer to so often, yeah. it's just a question out of curiosity. Uh, did you have an opportunity to use artificial lights because the lighting and the shadows are awesome and it's a very dark place. I have myself photographed there often and uh, considering the constraints, uh, I kind of know how difficult it is, you know, even with, uh, with, with very slow shutter speed. So uh, how did you manage the light? Okay, there's not a single picture uh, that I have shot in my entire life practically uh, where I have used artificial light. Okay. Oh, wow. I don't, I don't use lights. Uh, I shoot only in natural light. I shoot only in existing light. That's uh, a very, and, very important and, item. Mm. And even if you are in the darkest of spaces, if you stop and stay there and wait for your eyes to get adjusted, you will be able to discern both light and shadow. Uh, there, there is always light. There is always light. And it's a question of, and, and you know, with, with photography, I, especially with elephant and stuff, which I shot on film, I used to give exposures for you know 45 seconds, 60 seconds, uh, and you know the, the the beauty of that was always you know you could almost see that that faint glow coming off that rock and and actually entering the lens. You could almost see it, you know, entering the lens of the camera and then you know etching itself onto the film at the back. Or uh, you know, for me it was like a like an incredibly exciting uh, you know process and. Uh, I only use reflectors. I, I, I carry uh, either like a white bed sheet with me or I have these, um, you know, uh, round plastilite reflectors, which, are, you know, sometimes are silver, sometimes are white. Uh, but, and then even if you go outside the cave from outside, you can, even the slightest change in light, you can actually uh, control and, 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 and shed light upon uh, some of those sculptures uh, to highlight some aspect of it or the other. But really, I mean, it's all shot in natural light. And, and at the most, I would have used a reflector or two. Thank you, sir. Thank you. It was really amazing. Uh, if there are any more questions, please put it on the WhatsApp group because it's 8.30 now. We would uh, like to conclude. Shanaz, ma'am, would you like to please uh, give the vote of thanks uh, as well as uh, any closing comments, please? Uh, thank you, sir. I think it was a very, very interesting lecture. And, um, you know, you took us out of Bombay for once. <laughs> and we moved beyond our comfort zone. So that was also very welcome. And I think um, every one of us has gained a lot and it was a real visual treat and hope to have you more often with us at the Mumbai Research Center. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you so very much. much. Thank you thank all you of sir. you. For, thank you, sir. Thank yeah, you, sir, thank you all for right. attending. And uh, yeah, thank you, Venkatesh. Thank you, Ramesh. Thank you, Usha, uh, all of you. That is Madhu, yes. Uden, Uden ji, thank you ji. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. And we seeing you all on Saturday. We are having an OP Nair music program. So that's at 8 o'clock. And hope to see many of you all there. Thank you. Thank you very much for thank everything. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Bharaji. Thank you, Uden ji. Take care. Look after yourself. I hope you reach Angkor Wat this year. <laughs> We're hoping to. Definitely <laughs> hoping to. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Take care. Bye bye. Good night. Bye, Vekitesh. Good bye. night, Vekitesh. Good bye, night, bye. Sir. Good bye. night, sir. Bye. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, Vekitesh. Bye. Thank you, sir. Bye. Good night. It's